everyone! Welcome back to Mental Wealth Reads. Um, we're going to be starting a new video series, um, and appropriately from a new location. This is my home studio. Welcome to my room. Um, we're going to be uh, starting a new book. Um, like I said, it's called Trauma and Recovery, um, written by Judith Herman. Um, and it it's uh, by far one of the most extensive um, books about trauma that I've read. Uh, or started to read. Uh, you you guys are going to be starting it and finishing it with me for the most part. Um, and uh, so uh, I thought it'd be a good book to get into. Um, there's just a lot of um, there's just a lot of stuff uh, going on in the world that I think this applies to. Um, I I know what applies to it. Um, and um, I also think you know with the other two series that that we have going on, or well, the first two series that we started, um, you know, with with uh, man's search for meaning and and success through positive mental attitude, uh, it's in, it's important to uh, to be uh, more knowledgeable of of trauma, right? More knowledgeable of of what. Uh, what a person goes through, what 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 categorizes as trauma. I know there's uh, there's always that been a question of you know does this constitute abuse? You know if there's no marks, did he actually abuse me? And spoiler alert, the answer is yes, it still does. Um, but um, uh, I, I figured it would be a, a good. Um, like I said, a good subject to to jump into, um, as this is something that I think a lot of people are 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 looking to learn uh, these days. So uh, without further ado, we're going to get started. Um, the first chapter is going to be a little bit of a history, right? Um, and it's going to it's going to explain quite a bit. Um, it's going to explain just a bit about where our understanding of trauma has come from over the years, um, you know, with giving, uh, giving some uh, some, you know, credence to, to definition, of course, um, but, um, oh, and with that, I would like to say, um, if you are someone who has experienced trauma, um, uh, either firsthand or secondhand, um, please be careful with this video series, right? Um, there may be some things that are triggering to you, especially as we get deeper into, um, more definition, more examples, more, um, more discussion about it. Um, be sure to take care of yourself, you know? Um, if you're listening to this and, uh, the, um, uh, something, like I guess, that triggers you, please stop, you know? Uh, please stop watching the video. Um, and, and and really try and process what you're going through, right? And if you can't do that by yourself, find someone who can help you. Um, you know, uh, I you know uh, create this video for everyone, right? Um, but I also, like I said, do want to uh, uh, pay my respects to the people who've gone through this this sort of stuff, right? Um, you know, if you aren't ready for, uh, aren't ready to hear it, that is okay. You know, um, please don't beat yourself up for it. Uh, so, like I said, without further ado, we're gonna get started. Okay. Chapter 1. A Forgotten History. The study of psychological trauma has a curious history. One of episodic amnesia. Periods of active investigation have alternated with periods of oblivion. Repeatedly in the past century, similar lines of inquiry have been taken up abruptly taken up and abruptly abandoned, uh, only to be rediscovered much later. Classic documents of 50 or 100 years ago often read like contemporary works. Though the field has in fact an abundant and rich tradition, it has been periodically forgotten and must be periodically reclaimed. This intermittent amnesia is not the result of the ordinary changes in fashion that affect any intellectual pursuit. The study of psychological trauma does not languish for lack of interest. Rather, the subject provokes such intense controversy, controversy that it periodically becomes anathema. The study of psychological trauma has repe repeatedly led into realms of the unthinkable and founded it on fundamental questions of belief. To study psychological trauma is to come face to face both with human vulnerability in the natural world and with the capacity for evil in human nature. To study psychological trauma me means bearing witness to horrible events. When the events are natural disasters or acts of God, those who bear witness sympathize readily with the victim. But when the traumatic events are of human design, those who bear witness are caught in the conflict between victim and perpetrator. 
it is morally impossible to remain neutral in this conflict. The bystander is forced to take sides. It is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. He appeals to the universal desire to see, hear, and speak no evil. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. The victim demands action, engagement, and remembering. Leo Eidinger, a psychiatrist who studied uh, survivors of the Nazi concentration camps, describes the, cool, the conflict the cruel conflict of interest between victim and bystander. War and victims are something the community wants to forget. A veil of oblivion is drawn over every, everything painful and unpleasant. We find the two sides face to face. On one side, the victims who perhaps wish to forget but cannot, and on the other side, all those with strong, often unconscious motives who very intensely both wish to forget and succeed in doing so. The contrast is frequently very painful for both sides, the weakest one remains the losing party in this silent and unequal dialogue. In order to escape accountability for his crimes, the perpetrator does everything in his power to promote forgetting. Secrecy and silence are the perpetrator's first line of defense. If secrecy fails, the perpetrator attacks the credibility of his victim. If he cannot silence her absolutely, he tries to make sure that no one listens. <laughs> to this end, he marshals an, impress an impressive array of arrangements arguments, from the most blatant denial to the most sophisticated and elegant rationalization. After every atrocity, one can expect to hear the same predictable apologies. It never happened. The victim lies. The victim exaggerates. The victim brought it upon herself. And in any case, it is time to forget the past and move on. The more powerful the perpetrator, the greater his prerogative to name and define reality, and the more completely his arguments prevail. The perpetrator's arguments prove irresistible when the bystander faces them in isolation. Without a supportive social environment, the bystander usually succumbs to the temptation to look the other way. This is true even when the victim is an idealized and valued member of society. Soldiers in every war, even those who have been regarded as heroes, complain bitterly that no one wants to know the real truth about war. When the victim is already devalued, a woman or child, for example, she may find that the most traumatic events of her life take place outside the realm of socially validated reality. Her experience becomes unspeakable. The study of psychological trauma must constantly contend with this tendency to discredit the victim or to render her invisible. Throughout the history of the field, dispute has raged over whether patients with post-traumatic conditions are entitled to care and respect or deserving of contempt whether they are genuinely suffering or malingering, whether histories are true or false, and if false, whether imagined or mal maliciously fabricated. In spite of a vast literature documenting the phenomena of psychological trauma, debate still centers on the basic question of whether these phenomena are credible and real. It is not only the patients, but also the investigators of post-traumatic conditions whose credibility is repeatedly challenged. Clinicians who listen too long and too carefully to traumatize patients often become suspect among their colleagues, as though contaminated by contact. Investigators who pursue the field too far beyond the bounds of conventional belief are often subjected to a kind of professional isolation. To hold tra traumatic reality in consciousness requires a social context that affirms and protects the victim and joins victim and witness in a common alliance. For the individual victim, this social context is created by relationship with friends, lovers, and family. For the larger society, the social context is created by political movements that give voice to the disempowered. The systematic study of psychological trauma that therefore depends on the support of a political movement. Indeed, whether such study can be pursued or discussed in public is itself a political question. The study of war trauma becomes legitimate only in a context that challenges the sacrifice of young men in war. The study of trauma in sexual and domestic life becomes legitimate only in a context that challenges the subordination of women and children. Advances in the field occur only when they are supported by a political movement powerful enough to legitimate an alliance between investigators and patients and to counteract the ordinary social processes of silencing and denial. In the absence of strong political movement for human rights, the active process of bearing witness inevitably gives way to the active process of forgetting. 
Repression, dissociation, and denial are phenomena of social as well as individual consciousness. Three times over the past century, a, a particular form of psychological trauma has surfaced into political consciousness. Each time, the investigation of that trauma has flourished in affiliation with the political movement. The first to emerge was hysteria, the archetypal psychological disorder of women. Its study grew out of the Republican anti-clerical political movement of the late 19th century in France. The second was the shell shock or combat neurosis. Its study began in, in England and the United States after the First World War and reached a peak after the Vietnam War. Its political context was the collapse of a cult of war and the growth of an anti-war movement. The last and most recent trauma to come into public awareness is sexual and, and domestic violence. Its political context is the feminist movement in Western Europe and North America. Our, con our contemporary understanding of psych psychological trauma is built upon a synthesis of these three separate lines of investigation. The heroic age of hysteria. For two decades in the late 19th century, the disorder called hysteria became a major focus of serious inquiry. The term hysteria was so commonly understood at the time that no one had actually taken the trouble to define it systematically. In the words of one historian, for 25 centuries, hysteria had been considered a strange disease with incoherent and incomprehensible symptoms. Most physicians believed it to be a disease proper to women and originating in the uterus. Hence the name hysteria. As another historian explained, hysteria was a dramatic medical metaphor for everything that men found mysterious or unimaginable or unmanageable of the opposite sex. The patriarch of the study of hysteria was the great French neurologist Jean Martin Charcot. His kingdom was the Salpetrier, an ancient, expansive hospital complex which had long been an asylum for the most wretched of the Parisian proletariat. Beggars, prostitutes, and the insane. Charcot transformed this neglected facility into a temple of modern science, and the most gifted and ambitious men in the new disciplines of neurology and psychiatry journeyed to Paris to study with the master. Among the many distinguished physicians who made the pilgrimage to Salpêtrier were Pierre Genet, William James, and Sigmund Freud. The study of hysteria captured the public imagination as a great venture into the unknown. Charcot's investigations were renowned not only in politics. Charcot's investigations were renowned not only in the world of medicine, but also in the larger worlds of literature and politics. His Tuesday lectures were theatrical events attended by a multicolored audience drawn from all of Paris. Authors, doctors, leading actors and actresses, fashionable demi mondaines, all full of morbid curiosity. In these lectures, Charcot, Charcot illustrated his findings on hysteria by live demonstrations. The patients he put on display were young men or young women who had found refuge in the Salpetrier from lives of unremitting violence, exploitation, and rape. The asylum provided them greater, greater safety and protection than they had ever known. For a selected group of women who became Charcot's star performers, the asylum also, are, also, also offered something close to fame. Charcot was credited for the great courage in venturing to study hysteria at all. His prestige gave credibility to a field that had been considered beyond the pale of serious scientific investigation. Prior to Charcot's time, hysterical women had been thought of as malingerers, and their treatment had been relegated to the domain of hypnosis or hypnotists and popular healers. On Charcot's death, Freud eulogized him as a liberating patient of the afflicted. No credence was given to a hysteric about anything. The first thing that Charcot's work did was to restore its dignity to the topic. Little by little, people came, gave up the scornful smile with which the patient could at the time feel certain of being met. She was no longer necessarily a malingerer, for Charcot had thrown the whole weight of his authority on the side of the geniusness and objectivity of hysterical phenomena. Charcot's approach to hysteria, which he called the Great Neurosis, was that of the taxonomist. He emphasized careful observation, descrip description, and classification. He documented the characteristic symptoms of hysteria exhaustively, not only in writing, but also with drawings and photographs. 
Charcot focused on the symptoms of hysteria that resembled neurological damage, motor paralysis, sensory losses, convulsions, and amnesias. By 1880, he had demonstrated that these symptoms were psychological, since they could be artificially induced and relieved through the use of hypnosis. Though Charcot paid minute attention to the symptoms of his hysterical patients, he had no interest whatsoever in their inner lives. He viewed their emotions as symptoms to be catalogued. He described their speech as vocalization. His stance regarding his patients is apparent in a verbatim account of one of his Tuesday lectures, where a young woman in a hypnotic trance was being used to demonstrate a convulsive hysterical attack. Charcot, let us press again on the hyster hysterogenic point. A male intern touches the patient in the ovarian region. Here we go again. Occasionally subjects even bite their tongues, but this would be rare. Look at the arched back, which is so well described in textbooks. Patient. Mother, I am frightened. Charcot. Note the emotional outburst. If we let things go unabated, we will soon return to the epileptoid behavior. The patient cries again. Oh, mother. Charcot. Again, note these screams. You could say it is a lot of noise over nothing. The ambition of Charcot's followers was to surpass his work by demonstrating the cause of hysteria. Rivalry was particularly intense between Genet and Freud. Each wanted to be the first to make the great discovery. In pursuit of their goal, these investigators found that it was not sufficient to observe and classify hysterics. It was necessary to talk with them. For a brief decade, men of science listened to women with a devotion and respect unparalleled before or since. Daily meetings with hysterical patients often lasted for hours, were not lasting for hours were not uncommon. The case studies of this period read almost like collaborators between doctor and patients. These investigations bore fruit. By the mid-1890s, Genet in France and Freud with his collaborator Joseph Brewer in Vienna had arrived independently at strikingly similar formulations. Hysteria was a condition caused by psychological psychological trauma. Unbearable emotional reactions to traumatic events produced an altered state of consciousness, which in turn induced the hysterical symptoms. Genet called this alteration in consciousness dissociation. Brewer and Freud called it double consciousness. Both Genet and Freud recognized the essential similarity of altered states in consciousness induced by psychological trauma and those induced by hypnosis. Genet believed that the capacity for dissociation or hypnotic trance was a sign of psychological weakness and suggestibility. Brewer and Freud argued, on the contrary, that hysteria with its associated alterations of consciousness could be found among people of the clearest intellect, strongest will, greatest character, and the highest critical power. Both Genet and Freud recognized that the somatic symptoms of hysteria represented disguised representations of intensely distressing events, which had been banished from memory. Genet described his hysterical patients as governed by subconscious fixed ideas, the memories of traumatic events. Brewer and Freud, in an immortal sum summation, wrote that hysterics suffer mainly from reminiscences. By the 1890s, these investigators had also discovered that hysterical symptoms could be alleviated when the traumatic memories, as well as the intense feelings that accompanied them, were recovered and put into words. This method of treatment became the basis of modern psychotherapy. Genet called the technique psychological analysis. Brewer and Freud called it abreaction or catharsis, and Freud later called it psychoanalysis. But the simplest and perhaps best name was invented by one of Brewer's patients, a gifted, intelligent, and severely disturbed young woman to whom he gave the pseudonym Anna O. She called her intimate dialogue with Brewer the talking cure. The collaborations between doctor and patient took on the quality of a quest, in which the solution of the mystery of hysteria could be found in the painstaking reconstruction of the patient's past. Janae, describing his work with one patient noted that as treatment proceeded, the uncovering of the recent traumas gave way to the exploration of earlier events. By removing the superficial layer of the delusions, I favored the appearance of old and tenacious fixed ideas which d dwelt still at the bottom of her mind. The latter disappeared in turn, thus bringing forth a great improvement. Brewer, describing his work with Anna O, oh, spoke of following back the thread of memory. <laughs> 
It was Freud who followed the thread the furthest, um, and invariably this led to him had this led him into an exploration of the sexual lives of women. In spite of an ancient clinical tradition that recognized the association of hysterical symptoms with female sexuality, Freud's mentors, Charcot and Brewer, had been highly skeptical about the role of sexuality in the origins of hysteria. Freud himself was initially resistant to the idea. When I began to analyze the second patient, the expectation of a sexual neurosis being the basis of hysteria was fairly remote from my mind. I had come fresh from school, the school of Charcot, and I regarded the linking of hysteria with the topic of sexuality as a sort of insult, just as the women patients themselves do. This em empathic identification with his patients' reactions is characteristic of Freud's early writings on hysteria. His case histories reveal a man possessed of such passionate curiosity that he was willing to overcome his own defensiveness, and willing to listen. What he heard was appalling. Repeatedly, his patients told him of sexual assault, abuse, and incest. Following back the thread of memory, Freud and his patients uncovered major traumatic events of childhood concealed beneath more recent, often relatively trivial experiences that had actually triggered the onset of hysterical symptoms. By 1896, Freud believed that he had found the source. By 1896, Freud believed he had found the source. In a report on 18 case studies entitled The Etiology of Hysteria, he made a dramatic claim. I therefore put forward the thesis that at the bottom of every case of hysteria, there are one or more occurrences of premature sexual experience. Occurrences which belong to the earliest years of childhood, but which can be reproduced through the work of psychoanalysis in spite of the intervening decades. I believe that it is an important finding, the discovery of caput nili in neuropathology. A century later, this paper still rivals contemporary clinical descriptions of the effect of childhood sexual abuse. It is a brilliant, compassionate, eloquently argued, closely reasoned document. Its triumphant title and exultant tone suggests that Freud viewed his con contribution as the crowning achievement in the field. Instead, the publication The Etiology of Hyster Hysteria marked the end of this line of inquiry. Within a year, Freud had privately repudiated the traumatic theory of the origins of hysteria. His correspondence makes clear that he was increasingly troubled by the radical social implications of his hypothesis. Hysteria was so common among women that if his patient's stories were true and if his theory were correct, he would be forced to conclude that what he called perverted acts against children were endemic, not only among the proletariat of Paris, where he had first studied hysteria, but also among the respectable bourgeois families of Vienna, where he had established his practice. This idea was simply unacceptable. It was beyond credibility. Faced with this dilemma, Freud stopped listening to his female patients. The turning point is documented in the famous case of Dora. This, the last case of Freud's case studies on hysteria, reads more like a battle of wits than a cooperative venture. The interaction between Freud and Dora has been described as emotional combat. In this case, Freud still acknowledged the reality of his patient's experience. The adolescent Dora was being used as a pawn in her father's elaborate sex intrigues. Her father had essentially offered her to his friends as a sexual toy. Freud refused, however, to validate Dora's feelings of outrage and humiliation. Instead, he insisted on exploring her feelings of erotic excitement, as if the exploitative situation were a fulfillment of her desire. In an act that Freud viewed as revenge, Dora broke off the, the treatment. The breach of their alliance marked the bitter end of an era of collaboration between ambitious investigators and hysterical patients. For close to a century, these patients would again be scorned and silenced. Freud's followers held a particular grudge against the rebellious Dora, who was later described by a disciple as one of the most repulsive hysterics he had ever met. Out of the ruins of the traumatic theory of hysteria, Freud created psychoanalysis. The dominant psychological theory of the next century was founded in the denial of women's reality. Sexuality remained the central focus of inquiry, but the exploitative social context in which sexual relationship relations actually occur became utterly invisible. 
Psychoanalysis became a study of the internal vicissitudes of fantasy and desire dissociated from the reality of experience. By the first decade of the 20th century, without ever offering any clinical documentation of false complaints, Freud had concluded that his hysterical patient's accounts of childhood sexual abuse were untrue. It was at last obliged to recognize that these scenes of seductions had never taken place, and that they were only fantasies which my patients had made up. Freud's recantation signified the end of the heroic age of hysterica, uh, hysteria. After the turn of the century, the entire line of inquiry initiated by Char Charcot and continued by his followers fell into neglect. Hypnosis and altered states of consciousness were once again relegated to the realm of the occult. The study of psychological trauma came to a halt. After a time, the disease of hysteria was said to have virtually disappeared. This dramatic reversal was not simply the work of one man. In order to understand how the study of hysteria could collapse so completely and how great discoveries could be so quickly forgotten, it is necessary to understand something of the intellectual and political climate that gave rise to the investigation in the first place. The central political conflict in the 19th century France was the struggle between the proponents of a monarchy with an established religion and the proponents of a republican secular form of government. Seven times since the revolution of 1789, this conflict had led to the overthrow of the government. With the establishment of the Third Republic of 1870, uh, the founding fathers of a new and fragile democracy mobilized an aggressive campaign to consolidate their power base and to undermine the power of their main opposition, the Catholic Church. The Republican leaders of this era were self-made men of the rising bourgeoisie. They saw themselves as representatives of a tradition of enlightenment, engaged in moral struggle with the forces of reaction. The, the arist the aristocracy of the clergy. Their major political battles were fought for control of education. Their ideological battles were fought for the allegiance of men and the dominion of women. As Jules Ferry, a founding father of the Third Republic, put it, women must belong to science or they will belong to the church. Charcot, the son of, the trades of a tradesman who had risen to wealth and fame, was a prominent member of this new bourgeois elite. His salon was a meeting place for government ministers and other notice notables of the Third Republic. He shared with his colleagues in government a zeal uh, for the dissemination of secular scientific ideas. His modernization of the Salpetrier in the 1870s was carried out to demonstrate the superior virtues of secular teaching and hospital administration, and his investigations of hysteria were carried out to demonstrate the superior superiority of a secular over a religious conceptual framework. His Tuesday lectures were political theater. His mission was to claim hysterical woman for science. Charcot's formulation of hysteria offered a scientific uh, explanation for phenomena such as demonic possession states, witchcraft, exorcism, and religious ecstasy. One of his most cherished projects was the retrospective diagnosis of hysteria as portrayed throughout the ages and works of art. With the disciple Paul Richer, he published a collection of medieval art. Works With the disciple Paul Richer, he published a collection of medieval artwork illustrating his thesis that religious experiences depicted in art could be explained as manifestations of hysteria. Charcot and his followers also entered into acrimonious debates on the contemporary mystical phenomena, including cases of stigmatics, apparitions, and faith healing. Charcot was particularly concerned with the miraculous cures reportedly occurring in the newly established shrine at Lourdes. Genet was preoccupied with the American phenomena of Christian science. Charcot's disciple, Desiree Bournevelle, used the newly established diagnostic criteria in an attempt to prove that a celebrated stig stigmatic of the time, a devout young woman named Louise Leto, was actually a, hys a hys hysteric. All of these phenomena were claimed for the domain of medical pathology. It was thus a larger political cause that stimulated such passionate interest in hysteria and gave impetus to the investigations of Charcot and his followers in the late 19th century.
the solution of the mystery of hysteria, was intended to demonstrate the triumph of secular enlightenment over reactionary superstition, as well as the moral superiority of a secular worldview. Men of science con contrasted their benevolent patronage of hysterics with the worst excesses of the Inquisition. Charles Richet, uh, Richet, a disciple of Charcot, observed in 1880, among the patients locked away in the Salpetriere are many who would have been burned in former times, whose illness would have been taken for a crime. William James echoed these sentiments a decade later. Amongst all the many victims of medical ignorance clad in authority, the poor hysteric has hitherto fared the worst, and her gradual rehabilitation and rescue will count among the philanthropic conquests of our generation. While these men of science saw themselves as benevolent rescuers, uplifting women from their degraded condition, they never for a moment envisioned a condition of social equality between women and men. Women were to be the objects of study and humane care not subjects in their own right. The same men who advocated an enlightened view of hysteria often strongly opposed the admission of women into higher education or the professions of adamantly opposed and adamantly opposed female suffrage. In the early years of the Third Republic, the feminist movement was relatively weak. Until the late 1870s, feminist organizations did not even have the right to, to hold public meetings or publish their literature. At the first in International Congress for the Rights of Women, held in Paris in 1878, advocates of the right to vote were not permitted to speak because they were considered too revolutionary. Advocates of women's rights, recognizing that their fortunes depended on survival of the fragile new democracy, democracy tended to subordinate to their interests in order to preserve consensus within the Republican coalition. But a generation later, the regime of the Founding Fathers had become securely established. Republican secular government had survived and prospered in France. By the end of the 19th century, the anti-clerical battle had essentially been won. In the meantime, it had become more problematic for enlightened men to pose as the champions of women, for women were now now daring to speak for themselves. The militancy of the feminist movements in the established democracies of England and the United States had begun to spread to the continent, and French feminists had become much more assertive on behalf of women's rights. Some were pointedly critical of the Founding Fathers and challenged the benevolent patronage of men of science. One feminist writer in 1888 derided Charcot for his vivisection of women under the pretext of studying a disease, as well as for his hostility toward women entering the medical profession. By the turn of the century, the political impulse that had been given that had given birth to the heroic age of hysteria had dissipated. There was no longer any compelling reason to continue a line of investigation that had led men of science so far from where they originally intended to go. The study of hysteria had lured them into a netherworld of, tra of trance, emotionality, and sex. It had required them to listen to women far more than they had ever expected to listen, and to find out much more about women's lives than they ever wanted to know. Certainly, they had never intended to investigate sexual trauma in the lives of women. As long as the study of hysteria was a part of an ideological crusade, discoveries in the field were widely applauded, and scientific investigations investigators were esteemed for their humanity and courage. But once this political impetus had faded, these same investigators found themselves compromised by the nature of their discoveries and by their close involvement with their women patients. The backlash began even before Charcot's death in 1893. Increasingly, he found himself called upon to defend the credibility of the public demonstrations of hysteria that had enthralled Parisian society. It was widely rumored that the performances were staged by suggestible women who, knowingly or not, followed a script dictated under hypnosis by their patron. At the end of his life, he apparently regretted opening up this area of investigation. As Charcot retreated from the world of hypnosis and hysteria, Brewer retreated from the world of women's emotional attachments. The first talking cure ended with Brewer's precipitate precipitate flight um, from Anna O. Oh. He may have broken off the relationship because his wife represent resented his intense involvement with a fascinating young woman. Abruptly, he discontinued a course of treatment which had involved prolonged almost daily meetings with his patient over a period of two years. 
The sudden termination provoked a crisis not only for the patient who had to be hospitalized, but also apparently for the doctor who was appalled at the realization that his patient had become passionately attached to him. He left his final session with Anna O oh in a cold sweat. Though Brewer later collaborated with Freud in publishing his extraordinary case, he was a reluctant and doubting explorer. In particular, Brewer was not tr was troubled by the repeated findings of sexual experiences at the source of hysterical symptoms. As Freud complained to his confidant, Wilhelm Fleiss, not long ago, Brewer made a big speech to the Physician Society about me, putting himself forward as a convert to belief in sexual etiology. When I thanked him privately for this, he spoiled my pleasure by saying, but all the same, I don't believe it. Freud's investigation led to the furthest of all into the unrecognized reality of women's lives. His discovery of childhood sexual exploitation at the roots of hysteria crossed the outer limits of social credibility and brought him to a position of total ostracism within his profession. The publication of the Etiology of Hysteria, which he had expected to bring him glory, was met with a stony and universal silence among his elders and peers. As he wrote to Fleiss uh, shortly afterward, I am as isolated as you could wish me to be. The word has been given out to abandon me, and a void is forming around me. Okay. Freud's subsequent retreat from the study of psychological trauma has come to be viewed as a matter of scandal. His recantation has been has come to be viewed as a matter of uh, la, 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 la. His recantation has been vivified, vilified as an act of personal cowardice. Yet to engage in this kind of ad hominem attack seems like a curious relic of Freud's own era, in which advances in knowledge were understood as Promethean acts of solitary male genius. No matter how cogent his arguments or how valid his observations, Freud's discovery could discovery could not gain acceptance in the absence of a political and social context that would support the investigation of hysteria, wherever it might lead. Such a context had never existed in Vienna and was fast disappearing in France. Freud's rival Janet, who never abandoned his traumatic theory of hysteria and who never retreated from his hysterical patients, lived to see his works forgotten and his ideas neglected. Over time, Freud's repudiation of the traumatic theory of hysteria did take on a, particular, a peculiarly dogmatic quality. The man who had pursued the investigation the furthest and grasped its implications the most completely retreated in later retreated later in later life into the most rigid denial. In the process, he disavowed his female patients. Though he continued to focus on his patients' sexual lives, he no longer acknowledged the exploitative nature of women's real experiences. With a stubborn persistence that drove him into even greater convolutions of theory, he insisted that women imagined and longed for the abusive sexual encounters of which they complained. Perhaps the sweeping character of Freud's recantation is understandable, given the extremity of the challenge he faced. To hold fast to his theory would have been to recognize the depths of sexual oppression of women and children. The only potential source of intellectual validation and support for his position was the nascent uh, feminist movement, uh, which threatened Freud's cherished patriarchal values. To ally himself with such a movement was unthinkable for a man of Freud's political beliefs and professional ambitions. Protesting too much, he dissociated himself at once from the study of psychological trauma and from women. He went on to develop a theory of human development in which the inferiority and men mendacity of women were fundamental points of doctrine. In an anti-feminist political climate, this theory prospered and thrived. The only one of the early investigators who carried the exploration of hysteria to its logical conclusion was Brewer's patient Anna O. Oh. After Brewer abandoned her, she apparently remained ill for several years, and then she recovered. The mute hysteric who had invented the talking cure found her voice and her sanity in the women's liberation movement. Under a pseudonym, Paul Berthold, Berthold she translated into German the classic treatise by Mary Wollstonecraft, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, and authored a play, Women's Rights. Under her own name, Bertha Papenheim, uh, Bertha Papenheim became a 
prominent feminist social worker, or social worker, intellectual, and organizer. In the course of a long and fruitful career, she directed an orphanage for girls, founded a feminist organization for Jewish women, and traveled throughout Europe and the Middle East to complain against the sexual exploitation of women and children. Her dedication, energy, and commitment were legendary. In the words of a colleague, a volcano lived in this woman. Her fight against the abuse of women and children was almost a physically felt pain for her. At her death, the philosopher Martin Buber uh, com uh, commemorated her. I not only admired her, but loved her, and will love her until the day I die. There are people of spirit and there are people of passion. Both less common than one might think. Rarer still are people of spirit and passion. But rarest of all is a passionate spirit. Bertha Pappenheim was a woman with just such a spirit. Pass on her memory. Be witnesses that it still exists. In her will, she expressed the wish that those who visited her grave would leave a small stone, as a quiet promise to serve the mission of women's duties and women's joy, unflinchingly and courageously. We're going to stop there, because um, this has been a longer longer section than I in in initially anticipated. Um, but what I want to point out uh, right away um, is something that um, I think is... is you know, as somebody who is in the mental health profession, um, you know, and and also, uh, you know, has seen this, the, you know, trauma, has seen uh, sexual trauma, has seen varying times of trauma uh, with my clients. Um, the first chapter, you, when I read it the first time, and even now, um, particularly frustrated me on on a like uh, a a. a almost like a spiritual level, right? Um, you know, because there's, there's just mention of, of, you know, the very, very, very rough start um, that, that the study of trauma um, uh, had. And, and tr two, um, this is not only just the start of trauma, this is the start of psychology as well. Um, Freud, William James, uh, a few people that... Um, that were mentioned in here, they are the founding fathers of psychology. They are the people. They are the, the the men who are responsible for at least getting the ball rolling, right? Um, and you know, we we often knock Freud for for his uh, kind of crazy uh, beliefs and, and theories and things like that, um, and and rightfully so because some of them are, are absolutely bonkers, right? But at the same time, uh, you know, nobody had. Nobody had uh, uh, come to these conclusions yet, right? Nobody was was there before Freud saying like, Hey, I kind of thought this thing is a hypothesis, but, uh, you know, I, I, it's wrong. Don't, don't even go after it. Don't chase it. It's, nope, not even worth it, right? Because this is crazy. Um, so Freud was literally there kind of spitballing in the dark, just saying, what about this? Yeah, okay. What about that? Eh, that's not sticking on the wall. Okay. What about this? You know? Um, and, and, uh, you know, so it's interesting to see, um, how, how the very long, um, the very long, uh, start, uh, a startup uh, for for actually paying attention to psychology in general, mental health in general, um, took uh, you know in the beginning, especially considering uh, the fact that you know as as I mentioned, uh, you had kind of men in a like arms race here, you know, like just kind of like trying to beat each other at at, at discovering what these things were, you know, um, and I think it's unfortunately. Um, fitting um, for at least you know the the idea or the the concept of um, sexual trauma and sexual abuse uh, to have a beginning like this right to have a beginning where um, where you know it's it's not it's not it didn't start at a time where you know women just said hey um, this is happening to me and it's not great and it's it's freaking me out right it is messing me up to my core and having the response of a man you know of today's age being like oh my gosh like tell me about that like you know let's unpack that right as 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 a you know therapist you know male male and female will say today right um, 
And, and you know, I think even in the beginning of the book, uh, there was a line that just said, oh, and then this started, like, the most, um, the, an era of time where men paid the most attention to women um, yet and since. Um, you know what, I think, I think, I think our, our society can challenge that, um, uh, but also in, in ways he might be right, right? And we can, uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but, um, there, this chapter, you know, is, is very poignantly, um, pointing out the fact that, that, uh, there simply is, uh, psychology is a very young field. It's one of, the, it's the youngest science, um, you know, of all of them, um, because, you know, generations and generations of, of, uh, whatever form of, or whatever structure of, of, um, uh, mental health care, we'll say, uh, that was or was not at the time, uh, up until that time had just, uh, prevented, uh, any major movements in, in addressing the fact that, you know, the, the rub, rub, your, rub some dirt on it kind of idea was just not helpful, right? Um, and even the, even the, um, even the, the way that, that, um, you know, a family was viewed, right? The man is the house, the man of the house. He, he does all the things and the woman is just there to raise children and, and housekeep, right? Um, that idea uh, pervaded um, over centuries. You know, it was it's not just a thing of, you know, America in the early, you know, I don't know, early 1900s, right? Like, that's been a thing since the dawn of time, right? Um, and so, uh, in, in a uh, almost like poetic justice, right? Um, you know, these men who were just trying to, like, you know, prove themselves, you know, uh, you know, my, you know, my arms are, are stronger than yours, you know, that kind of a thing. My brain is bigger than yours kind of fight, um, unwittingly stumbled on something that they, they immediately had to recant because not only, um, was there not a, a, a social push or social means of support for what they were saying, but also they came to conclusions where, you know, you know, this doesn't look good. This doesn't make me look good as a man, right? Because of all these reports of sexual abuse and sexual trauma that these women are sustaining from men in society, right? Um, even including some men I might know, you know? Um, and so, um, you know, all things considered, you know, I think as unfortunate as the starting was, um, it was evidently powerful enough to get it started, right? It was evidently enough to say, you know, uh, to, to prove that things needed to happen, right? Because women were given a voice, and even if, you know, the, the, the leading psychiatrists or the leading psychologists, um, you know, eventually stopped listening to them, uh, genuinely, uh, they, they did get enough of a taste of being heard that, uh, they weren't gonna just go back to the way things were, right? And, and that's where, it, you know, uh, it talks about the women's rights movement coming along, the women's rights movement, uh, you know, coming to power, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to think of just how far the women's rights movement has come, uh, since then, right? Because now, now the women's rights movement's not necessarily fighting for completely different reasons, but back then it was simply just having a voice, right? Having a voice, letting me vote, letting me have some control over the life that I have, right? And and uh, this 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 shift, this this even this five minute, you know, uh, a glimpse into to the um, the psychology of, of what women were going through, um, however, uh, you know, vain the intentions were, right, uh, started the, the, uh, the crumbling a little bit of the patriarchy at the time, right? The, the crumbling of the, this idea that, like, you know, men were impervious, men were invincible, men can do whatever they want and have no consequences, uh, because we were seeing the consequences, right? The women were reporting the consequences, um, and, and, 
So, you know, like I said, reading that is, is something that gen generally frustrates me. You know, as much as I know that we've come a long way since then, um, it still is a bit frustrating just, just seeing um, particularly what, you know, how quickly or how easily um, Freud and Charcot just folded because... Uh, as the book says, there there just wasn't a political movement to support the advance of the knowledge that they were gaining, right? Um, and I, you know, I think I'm gonna leave it with that. Uh, this is this video is run a little long. I'm try I try not to make these any more than an hour, um, but um, I you know I'd be very interested in hearing what your thoughts are about this first little section because um, it's definitely a um, an interesting chapter. I don't know how many people know the history of, of this. Like, I don't know how many people have read up on this. You know, I, I've even gotten, you know, six years of, of education on stuff like this. And, you know, I knew the history, of course, of hysteria and things like that, but just the political context, um, you know, and background and things like that. Um, you know, very interesting, uh, very interesting take. Uh, so let me know what you think. Um, you know, and, and we'll continue some more, obviously, in the next chapter to talk more about the implications of, of this chapter on a mental health level. Um, but for now, I'm gonna let you guys go because um, I gotta get gotta get going. But um, leave your questions, concerns, uh, uh, comments, recommendations in, in the comment section, and um, I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care. Thank you.